Conversations from the Zoom Room. Hey everybody, Bill here, back on Art Alley in beautiful Solana Beach, California. We have a fantastic new episode of Conversations from the Zoom Room today. This is part two of Women in Vision. I hope you caught the first one because very compelling. We're gonna hear from some of the best and brightest ODs in the nation. We're gonna hear about a couple of different topics. First of all, we hear about family versus career and how to balance that. Next, we're gonna talk about the wage gap, right? And how to negotiate what you're truly worth. Uh, we're going to hear some predictions for 2030. Get ready for that. And last but not least, we have some amazing uh, reading recommendations coming up. So let's take it away. Conversations from the Zoom room. I mean, I think, you know, when we talk about particularly women as it wrote, pertains to optometry is that we are seeing a shift in the demographics of students, right? For so many schools, there are more women enrolled than men. Yeah. And I think fundamentally you have a generation where there were just more um, men there were more men optometrists than there were women. So just obviously from a numbers perspective, there were less opportunities for women to ascend to the top. And now I think you do have an empowered generation of women who, you know, I mean, I know Sheryl Sandberg is like canceled because Facebook is like destroying democracy, but lean in was really valuable to me in particular as an ambitious woman when I was in college and optometry school and her you know, concept of like, just stay in, just don't like, don't throw in the towel. And even reading Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, she talks about when she was in, it, when motherhood became a part of her life, um, she took a part-time job and she ended up realizing that she was working full-time hours and juggling her kids, but without any of the benefits of full-time work. So um, for her, she made the conscious decision, I will never take a part-time job again. I will only take a full-time job and I will bring my kids with me and I will let you know this is my full self. But to me, I think um, seeing women like that telling their stories and, and the women who have achieved that success explaining how they've done it has empowered me to understand that um, to break the glass ceiling, I have to stay in the race. You know what I mean? It's just a matter of staying in the race. And even if you have to kind of move things around or shift things or change how it looks, you have to stay in the game. And I think that is, um, you know, to me, it gives me a lot of hope and inspiration because if you look at the numbers and how women are continuing to be within, speaking specifically within the context of optometry, how women are continuing to be enrolled at a higher rate than men, if that trend continues, there will be no choice but to have women in leadership positions because that is what the demographic demands. So I think that there is um, a shift happening both in number one, kind of what Kate was saying, right? Finding that space in your home, that home within yourself. I mean, I in college felt like I'll be an optometrist for a little bit, then I'll stop working and I'll, you know, I'll go on and do something else. But now I definitely feel more of a responsibility to stay in the profession in some capacity because if you can, you must. I mean, everything that you guys said is awesome. So a, a lot of the things that actually Jen was saying about um, having a child and feeling that guilt is exactly why I've always never said I wanted to have children. I've never said I didn't want to have children, but I can't commit my brain to thinking that that makes sense if I want to love what I'm doing and devote all the time that I want to to my job, right? And one of the things that I've always thought about with, with women in general is actually to a certain extent, we're almost our worst enemy when it comes to that kind of stuff. Because I will have that bias about another woman. I will think that they want to have a family and they want to do all this stuff and then they're going to forget about the job that they have with me and all the things that I want to do and the things I want to go. It's not just men who have these thoughts, it's women who have these thoughts too, right? When you talk about like um, controversial things in the, the election and stuff like that, more women voted for Trump than voted for Hillary, right? That's crazy, <laughs> right? So, I mean, it's it, we 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 will undermine ourselves to a certain extent because we haven't hopped on board on the idea that we can be leaders and we can go forward. A lot of women choose optometry because it's flexible and they don't have to invest that way, right? It can be their fun thing and they can have a family, which is awesome. And they should have that flexibility if they want to have that. But I, I often think that the old guard of the, like the 10 white men who run optometry might stay there because they're going to be the people who keep getting brought up and like you were saying, they, you bring your friends with you. It might be the same thing that keeps coming, you know? 
<sighs> not a positive note, but that's kind of the thing that I think about <laughs> when I think about all this stuff and becoming yeah. a leader. We have one male in this room right now. So I would like, love to hear his perspective. Bill, think about uh, what we are discussing. Yeah, to... yeah thanks for asking, uh, Badisha. I appreciate that. So I see a uh, positive change happening uh, in our industry. I've been working in the industry and various capacities since I was 22. I started as a, a frame rep um, in San Diego and, um, and started a company and, and I've been involved in the industry, the Vision Council and so forth. And I'll just use that as one example. The Vision Council is a, you all know, it's an organization that represents a lot of different interests. Um, when I first started going to the Vision Council as a um, white uh, uh, man, uh, it was like, wow, there's a lot of white men here and they're all way older than me, right? I'm like, man, this is a total good old boys club. And frankly, uh, I, I felt discriminated against as, you know, a young white man. So I can't imagine what other women felt like and, uh, you know, different ethnicities. And it was just like, wow. And, and I don't, there was never any like, oh, you can't come here because this is our club. It was never that. But, um, you know, just th that as sort of a barometer of, of the industry. Um, the diversity within that organization, uh, the fact that, you know, Ashley Mills is now the CEO, the, uh, you know, the meetings that happen, uh, uh, it has really, uh, we've, we've come a long way, not far enough yet in the industry. Um, so it's, I, I'm seeing that as kind of a microcosm of what's happening in the industry. You know, from the optometry side of things, obviously the, the people who are, coming out of optometry school, it's, you know, we are definitely more female now than, than we were uh, before. So there, there, I think there's a lot of movement in the right direction. Um, and I, I hope it continues. Um, you know, and the, the one, one thing I wanted to, to mention around that is, you know, this, this issue of income disparity, you know, and Badisha and I were talking about income disparity uh, last week as we were preparing for this. And, um, it's an interesting, uh, troubling topic because, you know, we're, we're hiring, you know, a bunch of people right now. And so I've been conducting a lot of interviews and so forth. And, um, you know, I, I would really encourage all women to, to uh, negotiate more. Now, I'm doing these Zoom interviews with a, guy, a couple of finalists for this position we're hiring for. And, um, the guys are like, okay, what's my deal? What's the comp? And uh, how can I get this? And I need another 10 grand. And, you know, what about this? And uh, give me a Ferrari or whatever, you know. <laughs> I, I, that, I didn't get asked for Ferrari. I but. mean, are you giving Ferraris? Because I, I, I mean, you know, I can change what I'm doing if you're giving up Ferraris. Yes, uh, it's a Ferrari with a, a Yugo engine. Uh, you know, it's all chill, you know. We're so well. But um, uh, it, it's interesting, you know, just to see the difference between who asks for what and uh, I really would like to see women uh, you know, ask for what they deserve right and and be bold about it because I think what happens in a lot of uh, hiring situations is you know whoever's doing the hiring they're like I don't want to pay out you know I'll pay out what I can pay out right and then you find out later on that somebody's wow this person making 20 grand more than me they're doing the same job and I'm probably working hard, right? So I, I'm just curious about that. Just any input around this wage disparity and income disparity. In my personal experience, so last year I was actually interviewing for a really big job in optometry. And it was a job I wasn't qualified for because I hadn't been, I'd only been out of school for four years. Mm -hmm. But um, a male colleague actually recommended me for the job because he couldn't take it. And when we had a conversation about recommendation, or he recommended me for the job and I was able to ask him when the salary negotiation piece came up, how much did you ask for and what were you saying? And I was really happy that I did because the number I was going to ask for was literally $60,000 less than what he asked for. And had I not talked to him, I probably would have. And I really from Lean In is where I lean in that book. It, it truly talks about negotiating and how much men negotiate more than women. And it talks about asking male colleagues what they make. And I took that advice for myself. And in that particular situation, you know, it, it was 
shocking because I came back with the, he told me the number. So I told him the same number they told that he told them and they said, cool. Um, next step, like, you know, what's interview. And I'm like, I would have missed out on literally 60 grand had this opportunity really been for me, had I not asked, you know, someone else what they were doing. So I think um, negotiating is important, but like communicating with our male colleagues and understanding what are they asking for and what are they getting paid and letting them be allies in that negotiation process is, is valuable as well. Okay, and I know you've done a lot of research on this topic yeah. and you have like some stats that, that honestly were pretty disappointing about how even when women negotiate we still don't end up as much as men get after they negotiate. Yeah, yeah no, that's 100% true. So um, I don't have the exact stats off the top of my head. I can tell you the generalized view and then because also I can't fully reveal all the stats yet because we're hoping to have a publication uh, or some articles out in a large publication here soon. So that's the goal. So I can't reveal it all because if I do, then they'll say, sorry, you told. Um, so what that looks like is when Kind of a, the first number that I can kind of talk about is when women and men come out of optometry school, the average salary for all full-time positions everywhere in the United States, it doesn't matter if you've done residency or not, we did not take that into account on this number, is the average first year starting salary is $105,000. So 105 with three other zeros. Um, and that's for women. For men, it's 107. So we still have that $2,000 difference there. Um, so let's say that women come in and they say, ha ha, I'm going to negotiate. Women are intensely better negotiators than men, with, according to our data. Women will be able to get more money from their negotiation than men will, but that doesn't make up for the beginning starting difference. So the difference is so big in some, in some places, even when women negotiate, they don't necessarily reach that same level that a man will be able to get. So a couple of things to kind of bounce off and really lean into that topic of negotiation is one, um, knowing your worth and asking your male colleagues is a number one perfect. Two is actually like literally going to the U.S. Labor um, and Statistics Bureau in Statistics um, online resource and looking up in your area what's the average salary for what you want. So let's say you want to be an associate OD, like that's most people. So that's what they kind of look at um, as well as you can look. I mean, this is for any profession. You can look up what's the average for the job title you're looking for and you can see what that is. And then you can even break it down a little bit more. Usually you can do male and female and kind of see what that looks like. And that's tax reported information from businesses taxes in that area. So it's like the cream of the crop when it comes to data. Um, it doesn't tell you necessarily if, you know, when you're looking at salaries of whether that's a base salary, whether that's gonna be a production bonus, all of those things, but you'll be able to get a really good number for yourself. Um, knowing that number, so when you walk in, I mean, I always say, You've got to go like a, you've got to go above that. Approximately 10% is the data that's been shown by um, courses that I've taken through Yale as well as the AAUW courses I teach. So um, you've got to kind of boost it up. Um, but then also the biggest thing is that sometimes, um, especially when you just get out of school, this is for all people, but we've seen the numbers rise more with women is that we will take whatever we can get because we feel like we just need to have a job. Yeah. Um, it's like you see the student loans you're like i want a job um is also knowing your walk away value saying no this isn't this isn't enough for me um and knowing that because that's going to be a huge negotiation tool because as women and men do negotiate um we also come back into that double bind of how the the negotiation is perceived so as we kind of step into that world of negotiation and looking at how women and men negotiate different one thing to be considerate of as we kind of look at the numbers is that women you do a great job so we need to know that about ourselves but we just need to know what those numbers are so we can be able to ask as well as knowing that value that this is my base value that i cannot go below because if we all have a base value where like we cannot go below this number i mean that just raises the standard for everybody because when everybody men and women negotiate that wage gap does lessen so it doesn't matter if um there is a less of a wage gap when we look at numbers overall, of everybody negotiating um, compared to when there's no negotiation that occurs. That wage gap is larger when no negotiation occurs on either party side. 
So we're, we're jumping around a little bit, but um, this next one has to do with uh, with the next generation. Okay, so the question is, what do we need to do to inspire the next generation to move things forward and accelerate change? They always kind of love this topic because I love students, to be honest. I love when students reach out to me. I love mentoring students and helping them kind of navigate as they kind of transition and go forward, right? And that kind of, that's not even just like students anymore right now. I'm, I guess I'm two years out, so now I have knowledge about what happens in the world, I guess. Um, but um, it's, it. I always love to be able to help people learn about stuff. Like I, I just did a post on Instagram about how I fit a seven-year-old in soft contact lenses for myopia management. Right. And um, so I had a bunch of people reach out and ask like, wow, how did you like figure out how do you how did you feel comfortable doing something like that? And I'm like, this is the youngest person I've ever done it on. It's not it's like the first time I've ever done this. Um, but I kind of just jumped in and went for it, you know, and I, I think part of the things that we can help each other do that and be able to do that is one is do the social media posts and stuff like that. The weird stuff that you do that like will change the difference, inspire someone to do it is a good way to do it. I'm, a, I'm part of this group called the Young ODs of America. Um, I'm the liaison for um, the, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and we actually do a, a really good job because like, we don't have uh, chapters in every state, but a lot of the major states, Texas, New York, California, kind of spread all over. Um, we, we try to really just help people and bring up new topics, think about what, how can we keep propelling our entire profession forward, right? So like, we'll, we'll talk insurance. How can I maximize my BSP, right? Everyone has a, a, a differing opinion on BSP right now, but how can I make more money off BSP? We'll hit that topic, right? Because everyone wants to make more money. We want to take more money from the insurance companies rather than taking it from the patient, right? You know? And so how do we maximize those kind of things? How do I build a specialty into my practice? How do I do that? If I've never touched this thing, what do I do? What, how do I build that confidence, you know? Um, so we, we try to help people with that, with the young ODs. I really like the group and being involved in that one. When I talk to students or like whenever I speak to the next generation, I just always empower them to find the career that fits for them. Mm -hmm. And don't try and fit a square peg in a round hole. Like I felt like all through school, that's what I was trying to do. Everybody says you do this, you gotta do A, B, C, and D, and it has to look this way, it has to be this way, it has to sound this way. And it never aligned for me. And for many, many years, I felt like I have to change professions. Like I'm making the wrong decision because this doesn't, like, I don't love this the way other people do, or I don't love that the way other people do. So there's not a fit for me. Whereas that's not true. It's just a matter of like finding number one what you don't like those are points of information for you to help you point you in the direction of what you do like so really when it when i think about the next generation and inspiring them my goal is to always empower them to know that you can create the career that you want particularly in this profession and so i mean there's never a world in which i mean i don't know if you guys how familiar you are with fairfax avenue but it is like the streetwear capital of the world i mean it's like supreme and joe like i mean it's it is very cap casual, very cool, very hip. And I would have never imagined in a million years I'd be wearing sneakers to work and like that patients love it. And it's like, oh my, you know, like these, these that we'd be playing rap music over the speakers. I like walked in like, what kind of office is this? But you know, that actually really fits and it really is aligned with me. And I would have never known that something like this existed for me. And it is through trial and error and through really a belief that there is the path for me and I can bring my whole self to work. So I think when it when we talk about inspiring the next generation, I, I think we can expand the conversation between do you want to work corporate or do you want to work private practice into a much broader conversation about do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Do you want to have, you know, th there are so many options and there are so many channels. So I think really empowering students and young people entering the profession to know that you can truly design the life you want and create the career you want. And that is the benefit of optometry as compared to other professions. I, I love that because you guys both kind of talking about like fostering students and building them. And I know how, Daniel, like at first you struggled with this profession and then you found the way to do it in a way that you loved. And it's so easy to get siloed early in your career in doing optometry in a way that's not fulfilling. So having that education right from the start when you're here for you, like, hey, this career is what you make it. You can practice how you want to practice. But I think a lot of optometry schools are under pressure right now because they're having a hard time getting applicants. 
We know that there's a very low applicant to available seat ratio right now, and they're having a really hard time getting diverse applicants. Really? Um, less than 3% of optometry school students are African American. It's around 5% for um, Hispanic or Latin American. So. I think what we can't just put it all on the schools. The schools, of course, need to do their part in this. But each optometrist in our local community, what are we doing to, to engage our patients with this profession? We see families. We see kids. Are you talking to them about this profession? Do you have opportunities where you're getting um, people in your office to shadow? I know with COVID right now, shadowing is much more complicated <laughs> than it's ever been. So we actually decided at our practice this year to hire a summer intern instead. So we're having someone in the office that's trained, that knows what to do with proper health and cleaning. We're not just having someone following us around, it's only there for a couple hours. But I want people in my community to know about this profession. And a great way to do that is to engage with your community and bring them in. And so we shouldn't be waiting till it's time to apply for optometry school for people in our community to know about optometry. And all your staff, all these great people that you work with that are so good at eyes, oh my gosh, encourage them and empower them to go on to optometry school. They are not gonna be your technician for the rest of their lives. This is, this is not a career for them forever. They learn so much about eye care while they're with you and support them to go on to like that next step. And I think so many of the people that work in our office would make great optometrists if we helped encourage them to go that direction. And uh, I will add something like, you know, specifically as a, as a mom, that I want to be the example that I want my kids to follow. So with my boys, I'm a mom of two 11 year old boys, they're twins. And so I, I want to be, I want them to choose life partners for themselves who's like me, ambitious, who, who, who um, you know, provides, who believes in equal, equal opportunity. So a small example again from, from the time when my boys were four years old, um, it was their birthday party and I had invited um, all the kids from the daycare for the birthday party. And one of my sons being with, um, with a toy car. And a little girl comes by and asks him, Nirvan, will you share your car with me? I want to play with it. And my son said, no, boys play with cars. Girls don't play with cars. And the girl's mom was standing right there. So I immediately went up to Nirvan and I said, Nirvan, that's not right. Why do you think girls can't play with cars? Don't you see mom drive a car? Doesn't mom come and pick you up in a car? Both men, uh, boys and girls should be playing with cars. You need to share your car with her. <laughs> He did, and, and the girl's mom came and said, wow, that's a nice reply you gave to your son. I said, yeah, I need to teach him from a very young age that he should not be discriminating. You know? So this is a small example, but, uh, but it's important that we, we, we start teaching from a very young age on how, and inspiring our next generation um, on what is right, what, how, how, to, uh, how to treat others, how to be, how to be fair and equitable. Absolutely, and I, I'm really um, into this idea, you guys, of, about going out and evangelizing your, your profession, right? Because you never know. I had a situation last year where uh, somebody came to me, they reached out and they said, you know, you spoke at our school like eight years ago, right? And you're so inspirational. I got really inspired to get into design because of you. And, uh, you know, I thought, okay, I'm going there for an afternoon. I'm talking, you know, something. It was one thing in my calendar. <laughs> it wasn't like, oh, I'm totally out to do this and right. inspire. But, you know, just think of all the people you can inspire. And uh, uh, you know, maybe they chose this profession uh, because of you. So you're doing great things. I am, uh, I work with League of Women Voters, which is a voters registry. So it's the League of Women Voters started with the women's suffrage movement um, of a hundred years ago to get women the right to vote. So um, the I actually sit on the board for my local chapter and this Saturday at 10 a.m. Uh, I work on the virtual advocacy. So I take all of their social, all their ideas and I am able to put it into ways for us to do it on social media virtually and all those different options. So. I will be talking with all of them about an LGBTQ rights um, initiative that we're having uh, 
at the end of August so that we can be able to do that virtually and be able to help people be able to change their gender on their driver's license or their birth cert or um, on their social security or all of their legal documents, as well as be able to give them legal rights on changing their names and all things of that nature for a lot of our trans um, members of our society. Wow. Well, on Saturday at 10 a.m., I will be at work. So I work Saturdays. I work right now, we're, because of COVID, we're doing three days a week. That's how much we're open. So Saturday is one of those days. But on Sunday at 10 a.m., I will be in Joshua Tree, California, by myself, having a birthday retreat, solo vacation. I love to travel alone and just be by myself. So I'm going to be in the desert by myself, just soaking it in, relaxing, taking a break, turning my phone off, and completely unplugging from reality. Fabulous. Awesome. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. This background looks so interesting. There's like carpet boxes. <laughs> yes, I see your box there. Yes. So I, um, we, we bought a house and we are on yeah. Saturday. And my job is to have the baby outside of our home while the movers are here. So we're going to go visit my grandpa and not be in the way of all the movers. And then hopefully my husband takes care of everything and magically we're all moved in and the whole house is set up by the time it is time for um, nap time. Nice. <laughs> Big year for you, buying into your practice, getting a home. Wow. I know. Yeah. My, um, our bank account is in pain at the moment, but <laughs> this is what we work for, is to enjoy you know, the fruits of our labor. So this year I'm like really digging into that and making the investment in the rest of my life happiness. Cool. Uh, well, my yoga studio is closed uh, as of today. Yeah, so, yeah, right. uh, <laughs> more than likely, yes. I'm, uh, uh, I was encouraged by somebody yesterday. They said, just put it on your big screen and it's great and do the interactive class, this class at this time. Don't, don't deal with the stigma of, you know, uh, that it's just video. So I'm like, okay, so yes. <laughs> So now that you have the year has passed and 2020 is not the year we expected it to be, um, what is your vision for 2030? Oh. Um, so this comes up, so my husband is not in eye care, okay? He, he works in um, Biofarm and he constantly asks me, well, what is, ten, what is your 10 year plan? And I keep telling him like, 10 years in optometry? Like something happens next week that I'm not prepared for. I, I think this profession is very difficult to predict exactly what practice looks like 10 years from now, the technology that's gonna exist, the way that we deliver care. What I am very confident about is that optometry is a valuable service to our patients, and we are going to continue to adapt and change to serve the needs of our patients with the technology that's available. So the, the best way to do that care, we'll be there to provide it. And I just encourage doctors to be flexible. Like don't get too stuck in like, this is the way optometry is done, and this is the way we have to do it, um, because it's the way we've always done it. Like, Things are changing with us left and, right, left and right, with legislation, with the way insurances are reimbursing us. We have got to keep thinking on our feet and embrace this uncertainty of how practice is going to look to really thrive on that. So I'm, I'm trying not to get too caught up on what next week looks like right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Jen and, and I am optimistic and hopeful that 2030 will look a lot different than 2020. I think the beauty of this year is that we have all taken a collective pause and we are all given the opportunity to reimagine society and rethink about the future that we want to create. And I am optimistic that this time of reflection, both as individuals and as a collective, you know, as a country and even at globally, you know, as, as a planet, I think that we are being given an opportunity to readjust our course and again reimagine a future that is inclusive and equitable and more just for everyone so will it be perfect in 10 years I mean it's probably not gonna be all rainbows and butterflies but I am hopeful that not even not only just within the profession of optometry but within the greater context of the world that things will be um, better because of this year and this collective pause and this slowdown and this sort of societal reset that we're all being given.
Danielle, you literally took the words right out of my mouth. Um, I, I, I totally understand why people are like 2020 is canceled. Um, they don't want 2020 anymore, but I really have seen this as some of the most valuable work that I've seen uh, individuals and the collective country and world do together. I mean, how often do you get to see an opportunity for the whole world to kind of go through something at once? Um, I mean, literally there's, I think the last time it happened was about a hundred years ago when there was the last pandemic, you know, something that kind of happened all at once. And I read voraciously. I am constantly reading a book and I just read the book Untamed by Glennon Doyle and I highly recommend that one as well. Um, and she talks consistently about how do you want to, how do you imagine your world more perfect and more beautiful? Um, and I just see 2030 as an opportunity for me to um, kind of put my sights on that 10, that also tomorrow doesn't have to be perfect, that there is time, that there is opportunity and there's time to make that 2030. There is availability to be flexible. Um, there's availability for things to change in positive and negative ways, but I, I always believe good <laughs> outweighs the bad. Um, and I keep imagining a more beautiful and more perfect world that just includes every race, color, religion, sexual orientation, gender, just how we, gender identity, just how we identify as humans um, will be more equitable in 2030. I mean, I think also it's kind of funny as an optometry little pun, you know, like 2030 people like, like, ooh, my vision is just a little bit off. But I think it also gives, um, you know, gives us that moment to realize that we can also be 20 happy with that too. And just kind of be in a space where that's okay as well. Um, Cause I'm a 20 happy patient. And so I can be 20, 30 sometimes and I'm okay with it. So if I can be okay with it, everybody else can too. <laughs> You know, just um, jumping in on the 10-year vision, um, I just went through a process. We're doing a process right now where a day a week, uh, my partner and I are um, basically going to my backyard and doing strategic planning. And it's, uh, we're like, where should we do it? And he's like, where's your backyard? It's great, let's do it there. So we've got our flip chart out and we're following a, um, a system. It's a book called Traction. Uh, and if you haven't read it, I would highly recommend this. Uh, it's fabulous, it's great business planning. And one of the things that you start with is your 10 year vision. And this is obviously business plan, but it's um, incredibly uncomfortable to get into that realm of, you know, what's 10 years and you throw out all these crazy ideas. Uh, but, you know, through the process, you, know, you go 10 years, then three years, then one year. Right, and to do this just opens up so many possibilities. And uh, we, I think it was two, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, we set our 10 year vision. And uh, we're, you know, it's a big number financially, but also the more important thing was, you know, we, we set our, our ambition that, um, you know, we want software that we're building to be used in half of the optometry practices in North America. Right, because not so we'll make all the money, but moreover, it's so we can create delight in the field of optometry. Right, so that that's the thing. And so, like, without doing that kind of ten-year forecast, that none of that stuff would come together. So, uh, yeah, I'd say lean into the long range and see what's possible. There's, I, I'm excited to see where you all are in ten years. I'm sure, amazing places. Any uh, closing yeah. thoughts or questions or anything before we go off into the wild blue yonder? No, I appreciate the inv invitation. I feel like I'm surrounded by a bunch of rock stars, but <laughs> uh, I appreciate yeah, the invitation. Right. I was having a great time. It was really fun. Yeah, I, you're yeah, all... I agree. It was a great, great panel. I agree. Awesome. And great company. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thank having letting this one dude in. in uh, <laughs> I really appreciate it. Guys. So thank you so much. I have uh, utmost respect for all of you. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good night. Have a wonderful night. night. Take care. Conversations from the Zoom Room.